Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Angela Love Zorenka, Program Director for Lactation Education Resources. Hello, and I am Sakita Lewis Johnson, the Accredited Provider Program Director for LER. Thank you, and welcome for welcome to this session of Real Talk. So just a little bit about us. I am a board certified lactation consultant. I've been working in community support for over 30 years, have worked in private practice, worked in a hospital, baby friendly, globally, et cetera. How about you, Sakita? Yeah, I am a board certified family nurse practitioner, lactation consultant, birth doula, and former labor and delivery nurse, former educator, and yada, yada, yada. So there you go. <laughs> still an educator so let's go today let's dive in and see what uh what we can chat about today but first let's get go through a little housekeeping so as far as questions are concerned if you have any questions please take a look at the blue arrow which is indicating where you will find the question box and you can use that as either a question box or a chat box if you just want to say something to us like hello and where you're participating from today if you're participating on a mobile device take a look at the question mark indicated by the green arrow at the bottom of the interface and that will show you where you can ask questions or you can make comments we also do have a handout which is right underneath. It should be right underneath the um, question box. It should say handouts. And so you're welcome to go ahead and download that as well. So joining our webinar today is Wendy Lawrence. Wendy is from our amazing customer support team and has been with us for many years and is all very familiar with what it means to be a lactation consultant and how to, how to get to your goal. Also, we have Jill who is part of our tech team, and she is on the call to help with any tech issues you may be having. Having, You can also reach out to us via our support forum, support at lactationtraining.com, if there are any questions that we don't answer today or anything else that you would like to ask. All right, so let's dive in and take a look at what a lactation consultant is and how you can follow your passion and become one. If you do decide to become an IBCLC, you will join more than 35,000 IBCLCs in over 134 countries and territories around the world. Credentialing as a lactation consultant is offered by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners or the IBCLC Commission. Take a look at their website, ibclc-commission.org. They have different regional offices depending where in the world you reside or work. Review the requirements and pathways to become eligible to take the IBCLC exam. What do you need to know? The detailed content outline or exam blueprint is based on a survey of IBCLCs in various practice settings. The outline covers all of the topic areas and chronological stages an IBCLC needs to know in their work. LER courses cover the entire detailed content outline and our courses are approved by LARC. That's the organization that evaluates and approves lactation consultants training courses, also known as the Lactation Education Accreditation and Approval Review Committee. Sakita will re review a few questions that you wanna ask yourself before you start on your journey. Sakita? Thank you, Angela. So. You know, we're going to talk about the realities and the realness of becoming a lactation consultant. And so I think it's important always to be more so of a reflective person or clinician. And so some of the questions you want to ask yourself today is when we're talking about all of the skills that we're going to talk about, do I have these skills? And then if you look at the things that we talk about today and say, whoa, this piece I'm lacking, this piece I'm lacking, then obviously, you know, you have to obtain those skills to so think about where will you get these skills? Like, who are you partnering with? What uh, resources do you have around you that can help facilitate and grow you into a well-rounded lactation consultant so that you are prepared and ready for the real world um, and the landscape? All right, so what makes a what makes an IBCLC? Look, I was gonna say competent before I even said anything. Competency is by far 
the most important uh, role that we'll ever play uh, or skill that we'll ever have whenever we're trying to accomplish a, a task. And it simply means to be able to master the skill, to be able to do it confidently. It means that you have the knowledge, the skill, and the attitude to be able to assist certain lactation um, issues. Now with IBCLCs, we actually, um, our background is that we manage, we clinically manage um, lactation concerns. And so you want to be careful and you want to make sure that you are truly going into the field with a level of competency, particularly novice level, but that you're going to build up on those skills and become more competent, broaden your knowledge. But so with that, in essence, what that will do is protect the public, protect the people that you are serving. To be competent means you can truly deliver care without harming. And so that is key to almost every profession that, um, that we, that across the board, across the world. However, when you're dealing with couplets and families, it's also integral to their health, their well-being, and their lactation journey. So competency is key. All right, culturally appropriate, incredible. Um, for me, these go hand in hand, but really let's unpack what culturally appropriate means. Um, some people who've worked in healthcare, you've heard the word culturally competent. Um, it's not culturally appropriate, it's not culturally competent. Um, sometimes, you know, there's, a, I believe in multiple realities, and I do believe that, you know, competency says that you've mastered someone else's um, culture, and I, I, I get stuck there. So instead, I lean into the concept of cultural humility, and which means that we reflect upon ourselves. It's a lifelong process of really thinking about our values before we're interacting with others, and that we're just um, really tapping into the humanity of folks and their values and their beliefs, and that we're appropriate and sensitive to their needs. And in order to do that, really and truly, you also have to come across as credible um, because you can't really walk into a situation not really knowing someone's um, and not really respecting their culture and not really make, making presumptions or assumptions about who they are. Once you do that and you walk into a clinical situation, sometimes you'll, you'll lose credibility. And so with that uh, being said, you know, I know some working in the field, some of my colleagues have typically said things like, oh, in their culture, they usually do this, or they do that, or they do this. And I want to be, you know, really mindful of this, this concept of being culturally appropriate means understanding that within cultures, there are, sub, there are subcultures. And so, you know, the first part of that is really, again, just seeing the humility and not really feeding into the stereotypes, not really making assumptions about what a culture will do, what a culture won't do based on some data. Um, sometimes data can be skewed. So you don't really know, really, unless that particular person has really told you, you know, that, yeah, this is a part of what I value. This is a part of my culture. This is what we do, you know, and then you can go into, you can really talk about that with that person. But, you know, be careful of just painting people with this broad brush based on their background, whatever that background or culture may be. Being a credible resource, I talked about that for a minute, but I do want to really say before I move on to the next topic is that be careful of when you are asked a question. As lactation consultants, sometimes a lot of us got into this work because we have had our own lactation experience or we've helped a lot of people um, in the, in, on their lactation journey. You want to be careful of just looking at your own experience or the experience of people around you and answering questions. You know, if you try to go off of your lived experience and not what the evidence says, that can cause lots of problems for families. And that can also make you lose credibility. 
So being credible means that you are giving out information that coincides with the best evidence and that you really know what you're talking about. Because if you lose credibility, that translates to the entire profession of lactation consultants losing credibility. And I'm not going to go off on a tangent, but I will say I see that on social media a lot. Um, and really and truly, I see bad information being given and I see great information being given and I see folks arguing between the two, right? Um, and so being credible means that you are really giving out information that you know. And if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know, let me go check that out and let me get back to you. And that's how you you know, develop a sense of credibility. And that is who we strive to be as IBCLCs. Policy advisor, creator, and advocacy. Those are huge roles that we play. Um, and I wanna say this about policy. You know, a lot of folks don't know that yes, we help shape policy. You know, policies have to be written, and sometimes the language in which they're written in can sometimes have unintended consequences and can sometimes be harmful. And so, and then there's some policies that are well written and are very well designed to be helpful. The point is, is that as IBCLCs, we are stakeholders and we are also policy advisors and creators. And so with that being said, you know, policy is not your strong suit, however, or but I should say, if it's not your strong suit, you're still at the table as a stakeholder because all policies related to lactation and the lactation landscape impact us and it impact our families. And so we can be sitting at the table advocating for a certain cause. And so that's a huge part of what we do. We are on the front lines advocating for families, really advocating to remove barriers that really throw them off of achieving their lactation goals or their chest feeding and breastfeeding goals. So with that being said, if you can sit at the table and just be a listener and really think about how does system policy impact um, the community I serve, really and truly, you know, that's what we do and that's what we are part of. And, you know, <clears throat> The key thing is that we are stakeholders in all of it, whether we are advising, whether we're listening, whether we're advocating, it is our role to be there and to know what's going on. Being a problem solver and researcher, you know, being a problem solver probably is about 90% of what we do, because you think about it, when you're called to assist someone, it's because they have a concern, a problem, or an issue, however you define it. Um, so what we do is we really go in and we are assessing what this is all about. What does this family need? What are they asking? And it's important that when you go into situations where you're called to seek, you know, this problem, you know, that we never look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is a one size fit, fit all. You just need to change the baby's position like this or you just need to do this. You know, you really want to think about what the client is asking in detail, like really know what they're asking and then help them to achieve or to solve whatever issue they, they, they may be having. And so along with that, sometimes you have to be researcher. Remember I said you have to sometimes go back and say, oh, I don't know that. Let me get back to you. Let me look that up. You really want to lean into the fact that we have to look up things because there's so much to learn, there's so much to know, and sometimes we don't all walk around with it in our heads like computers do, but we do have to refer to our resources. So we are lifelong researchers in that as knowledge change, as information change, as clinical protocols change, we have to constantly be going back and saying, hey, all that protocol change, there's, uh, better evidence that supports this way of doing things, right? There are also researchers who actually do research. There are lactation consultants, I'm sorry, that actually do research, who publish papers. And so, you know, um, that's also an integral part of what we do because, you know, if those that are interested in lactation are really not doing the research, then the research may not get done. So there's ways to go about being a researcher, but the ultimate thing is just to make sure that you are giving information 
that has been well researched, that is evidence based until the next level of evidence comes out and proves it differently. High level lactation in skilled care. When we think about this, a lot of times, you know, um, I can count the number of hands, um, the, the number of times, I can't count, I should say, the number of times someone have just thought like, I just go from room to room, just latching babies, like that's my job. I'm just gonna go here, here, they ready to eat, okay, I'm gonna help you latch, I'm gonna help you latch. Nope. Lactation consultants, we really are expected to be able to deliver care on a continuum. That means that we're delivering care from the lowest acuity person means that they maybe just need some reassurance to the highest acuity person, which means maybe they're in the ICU and maybe they're intubated. So there is an acuity model, if you are not familiar with it, and it's a three-level model that says these this set of situations require this level, this set of situations require this level. And what it means is that as a lactation consultant, you'll be able to critically think through, for instance, the cases where someone is in an ICU and they do need help and they are intubated or maybe they're on life support. All of the things that comes along with that, the IVs that they may have, the um, supporting the nurses who are supporting the client, you know, learning the medications, what part of the body has been um, operating on? If it was the brain, how does that impact lactation? What can we expect? And so I know that I'm saying a whole bunch of things and you're probably like, oh, what, we have to know that? Yes, you do in due time, but that's why we're here. We're really talking about the realities and the expectations of being a skilled high level practitioner. essential and timely. Um, during the pandemic, the word essential was being thrown around and thrown around and thrown around. And those of us who was, who was really working in the trenches, still seeing clients, we really began to understand what it meant to be essential. And we are essential. And I just want to say that, you know, I kind of felt like during that time that essential was a buzzword, but it really wasn't because as places were closing down, um, shutting down their lactation services, families were still in need of tons of support. And so it was important for us as lactation uh, consultants to figure out how can we best support clients while also keeping ourselves safe? How can we support babies to um, get the optimal health and nutrition that they deserve, particularly during um, emergencies or pandemics, right? And so we found out that yes, we are essential. And there were some barriers to that. And um, what came along was telehealth. And so yes, you know, telehealth is great. And it's one of the great tools that we were able to really tap into and use and really kind of hone our skills in it. But there are some times when families still need in-person care and timely care. And if we can't get to folks in a timely manner, guess what? They're going to say, well, you know what? I tried and it didn't work for me. And so it's, it's critical to understand that if a family calls you and they are in need, timeliness is of the essence to really help them achieve their goals. And so sometimes it's like, you know, you want to be like, oh, I can't, I can't do this. If you are not able, if you are strapped, make sure you, for time and capacity, make sure you have folks that are around you that you can say, okay, I can't get to it, but this professional over here maybe can get to, to this person, right? Because that truly um, makes the difference for families and their lactation journey. And also um, how reliable we are. Do we show up? It also impacts our profession because if we are saying, we see clients, but we can't get to them for two weeks later. What do you think has happened in those two weeks? So you want to be real careful with, um, you know, understanding that lactation concerns are usually of a timely nature. Collaborative care partner, um, you know, and being trusted. This is a phrase that I love. I really love collaborative care partner because it really assumes that I'm not the expert. 
I am collaborating with the client. I am leaning into what they're telling me. I'm assessing all the other things I need to assess on my end, but I'm really understanding that it is the my client's goals, also their fears, their concerns, their barriers, that really takes precedent and they are the center and they are the expert. So, you know, I know that we we go into every situation like we are the rah-rah of lactation. It's exclusive six months, you know, blah, 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 you know, and, and, and we we can quote the data, we can quote the, the guidelines, the recommendations, but sometimes it's important to really listen to what the client is saying and really say, okay, let's talk about what's feasible for you. Um, and understanding, yes, we know all of these recommendations. We do have to understand that we are collaborating in partnership and in agreement that when someone is seeking our assistance, that we approach it in that manner, that we're not overstepping and making assumptions on what the family can and can't do based on our own lived experience. And so in that sense, being a collaborative care partner is like saying to the person indirectly, I see you as a person, we're in this together. I am not higher than you. There is no hierarchy. We are collaborating simply to do what is best for you. And that is truly how you become trusted. When you, again, go into clinical situations and you, you know, um, assume a hierarchy, like, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know this. I know that. This is what we're going to do. Blah, 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 blah. You go in with your spiel, because I, I hear this a lot. The lactation consultant just came in with this spiel. It looked like it's rehearsed, or she said it 50 times. That's not being a collaborative care partner. That means you have this spiel for everyone, and that, that is pretty much operating from a one-size-fits-all framework. And so um, with that being said, always, 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 you know, when you're ever called to assist, even if it's called to assist for latch, you know, making sure you get consent to touch. If someone said they need latch assistance and you just assistance and you just assume it's okay to touch and you just come in and without them telling you exactly what type of assistance they need and without you asking, is it okay? You know, do you mind? And consent means every single time you're going to touch, letting someone know that. And that is truly um, how you become trusted is letting the person tell you what their needs are, how they would like to be helped, and even if they want to be touched or not. And so, so in essence, what I've described, all of the key elements is, is basically person-centered care. Um, I've talked about culture, I've talked about communication, collaboration, and, and the type of care that we deliver. And the person is at the center of it all. And I just want to read something from the Institute of Medicine and the definition of their, um, the definition of patient-centered care as defined by the Institute of Medicine is providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values and ensuring that the patient values guide all clinical decisions. And so this sums up again, not really going from a one side, going to a one size fit all model for all the clients that we're seeing, even though the concern might be the same latch issue. This person is having latch issue. It may not be for the same reason. And it's important that we keep that in mind. It's also important that we really look at this definition and we look at what it means to deliver person-centered care because so many times in healthcare, this too just becomes a buzzword. And so keeping all of those skills that I just talked about at the forefront of your practice, at the forefront of your mind, and to going into being a lactation clinician, if you keep all of those, I promise you, you will be delivering person-centered care and it won't be just a buzzword. So some questions to ask yourself today. You know, Angela is about to pop on the screen and she's going to start to talk about, ooh, all the steps, all the things you need to do to get in line to really get this thing going for yourself. Before though that, I need you to write these questions down and even reflect on them as you leave out today. What pathway is most appropriate for you? What does the local market look like? 
You know, is your area saturated with lactation consultants or not? Most times it's not, right? And all the steps that you need to take in order to become an IBCLC, how do, how do they fit into your lifestyle? How are you going to get all of your clinical hours? How are you going to get your schooling if that needs to be done? Like realistically, how does it work? So I'm going to wish you best wishes on your journey. I'm going to say buckle up because Angela's got a lot of great information to get you started on your journey. Thanks so much, Sakita. So do keep those questions coming. We have been answering them in the chat. And so if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and type them in now and we'll get to a few of them as soon as we talk about how to actually do this. So it can feel a little bit complicated, but there are steps that we are going to outline that we're gonna break it down. And we're going to touch base on each one of these different sections and how we can help you every step of the way. So the first thing you need to do is to choose a pathway. We're gonna come back to this in just a moment. Each pathway has three components. The first is the education piece. The second is clinical hours, and then it's getting ready for the exam. Okay, so the first component, health science education. It's the typical education for healthcare providers. There are eight post-secondary or university level courses and six general education subjects. You can find a full list of each of these 14 subjects on the IBCLC Commission's website. You can search for it or find the link in the resource document in the handout. The eight university level courses are, and you don't need to write these down now, biology, anatomy, physiology, infant and child growth and development, introduction to clinical research, nutrition, psychology or counseling skills or communication skills, and finally, sociology or cultural sensitivity or cultural anthropology. They can be online or in person as long as the institution is accredited to provide the learning. Now, if you took those courses during your college career, they count, even if it was 20 years ago. LER has this amazing partnership with Walden University to provide the basic courses. Walden is online, those courses can be taken from anywhere in the world, and we have worked together to choose the best courses that fit the IBCLC Commission's requirements. We also have special pricing as part of our partnership with Walden to try to remove one of the barriers to becoming a board-certified lactation consultant. Now, the six general education courses are medical documentation, medical terminology, occupational safety and security for health professionals, professional ethics for health professionals, universal safety precautions and infection control, and basic life support. Now, five of the six general ed courses can be taken through LER. The only one you're gonna to need to search for is basic life support. In many countries, there is an in-person skills check for this training. I have heard of some organizations providing this training completely online now, so it is important to check with your local resources. The guide provides general descriptions for typical courses in each subject area from, for the university courses. So do keep in mind that the IBCLC is international. The names used in their documents to describe the courses may not exactly fit the description at your educational institution, but that's okay. You'll note those broad terms with the understanding that there is no one universal description for, say, what a course in clinical research should cover. Why are these 14 courses required? The IBCLC is a standalone credential, meaning you don't need another certification, degree, or license to be an IBCLC. Once you pass the exam, you will be an allied healthcare professional. The courses will help you to be prepared for your career as well as to help you pass the exam. So the second part is lactation education, lactation specific education, and that is where lactation education resources has you covered. The education, according to IBCLC commission, should be comprehensive and cover the detailed content outline, which ours does. The commission requires at least 90 hours of lactation education and five hours on communication skills. 
Our five hour course is, spe is specific to lactation and breastfeeding care to help you in your practice as a lactation consultant. Now the third component is lactation specific clinical experience. This can be in-person consultations, telephone consultations, or online breastfeeding and lactation care that supports breastfeeding families. It also includes lactation assistance to pregnant and breastfeeding or chest feeding clients and lactation education to families and or professionals. These hours are to be obtained within the five years immediately prior to applying for the exam. So now how many clinical hours do you need? Well, that depends on your pathway. So as I mentioned, they need to be accrued in the five years before you apply for the exam. And so here's sort of a quick overview of the three pathways. So pathway one is for healthcare professionals and those who provide breastfeeding support through an IBLCE recognized breastfeeding support counselor organization. Healthcare professionals, according to IBCLC commission, includes physicians, nurses, midwives, dietitians, physiotherapists or physical therapists, speech pathologies, speech pathologists, and others. Breastfeeding support counselors include those accredited through organizations such as LER and La Leche League, the Australian Breastfeeding Association, and others. Pathway 2 applicants must complete a comprehensive academic program in human lactation and breastfeeding through an accredited university program. Their education has both didactic and clinical components, and they require 300 clinically supervised hours working with breastfeeding families. Pathway 3 is a structured mentorship program between an IBCLC and the applicant. The IBCLC or IBCLCs, if there's more than one, should be in good standing with IBLCE. Those who choose this pathway must have their program pre-approved by IBLCE prior to beginning their clinical hours. So a quick note, for those of you who may have breastfed or chest fed or provided human milk for your baby, the hours you spent nursing, pumping, and helping your friends doesn't count towards your clinical hours. Now, while the 500 or 1,000 hours seems like a lot, there's a really good reason why. Each candidate needs to have the clinical experience so they can provide competent care as an IBCLC. If it's any consolation, the number of hours required was a lot more. I've known IBCLCs who needed anywhere from 2,500 to 8,000 clinical hours to sit the IBLCE exam. So let's go back a little bit more and delve into pathway one. So you need at least a thousand clinical hours, as well as the college courses, as well as the lactation specific education. For the candidate who's also a healthcare provider, the hours can be done in a hospital, birth center, clinic, lactation care clinic or practice, or through independent practice as a licensed or registered healthcare professional in a non-healthcare setting. For breastfeeding support counselors from an IBLCE recognized organization, their hours can be earned in person or online. The location and type of support depends on the criteria provided by the recognized organization. The hours need to be counted on an hour by hour basis. So two important points about pathway one clinical hours. You need to document the hours as you accrue them. Be very detailed in case IBLCE chooses to audit your application to take the exam. They may want to see your documentation, such, such as a spreadsheet or other document where you counted your hours. And the second important point is that the thousand hours do not need to be directly supervised. Note that LER does have a program for those of you who are not already affiliated with a breastfeeding support organization. The LER hours program offers you a way to gather those thousand hours in your community. So now for pathway three, it's 500 clinical hours. It's best done in a busy practice setting where you can work with many breastfeeding, chest feeding people, and those providing human milk to their babies every day, such as a hospital or clinic setting. The hours count towards the 500 only when you're actually working with families. Observation hours don't count. Remember that clinical experience is graduated. That is, it starts with observation, 
then doing tasks under supervision, then completing those tasks independently with the IBCLC close by to ask questions and discuss the situations. LER has an internship program with many sites around the US. Reach out to support at lactationtraining.com and we can connect you with our clinical internship director, Amy Black, to determine if we have a site in your area. If not, we can give you suggestions on how you can work with your local hospital to facilitate an internship site. So one thing Amy wanted me to mention in this webinar is that you can't start to count your hours towards the internship requirement until both you and the IBCLC are comfortable with you working independently. Most interns will spend about 75 hours in orientation before you can start to count the hours towards your 500. Or you can take a look in the community to find a willing internship site or mentors. You may need to reach out to several people to find someone with the time, experience, and capacity to agree to be your mentor. It's important to find a good fit. Talk to others who've been through Pathway 3 to find successful strategies with finding a good mentor. Now, while this pathway has an additional step or two, is it worth it? It is. It will see reports that students who come through Pathway 3 usually score best on the exam. I think it's that mentorship piece, having someone to sort of bounce ideas off of and to learn from, which is the key component. It's really worth that extra effort in the beginning of this pathway, so do take a look around and see who's willing to be a mentor for you. Now, a lot of people are asking whether or not they can accrue clinical hours via telehealth during the pandemic. The quick answer is yes. The longer answer is paraphrased from IBLCE documents. IBLCE will allow the use of technology if certain parameters are met. You'll need to pay attention to privacy rules in your area and the Code of Professional Conduct, as well as the clinical competencies for IBCLCs. So, the lactation-specific education. We have two different ways to gather your 95 hours. The first one is the Lactation Consultant Training Program. It's the full 95 hours front to back. The other one is either core or bridge. They are designed to meet your education needs depending on your background and your previous lactation training. So first, we have a comprehensive course called the Lactation Consultant Training Program. It's 90 plus hours and it's eligible for SERPs, CME, and nursing contact hours. It's intended for those who do not have any lactation education and they know they want to be an IBCLC. We have more than 35 of the most knowledgeable, experienced instructors who are practicing lactation consultants, researchers, and authors who teach in our courses, including Sakita and me. Our classes are economical. You can view them on a variety of devices such as your computer, tablet, or smartphone. They're optimized for a computer, but they can be reviewed later when you're on the go. We've been educating people in person and online since 1990. We update our course information with the latest peer-reviewed evidence on a regular schedule, but we will update sooner as new evidence emerges. Have a question for the instructor? You can send an email to our support forum and we have IBCLCs available to answer your questions. Want to discuss a concept with your fellow students? We're discussing innovative ways for people to connect. Stay tuned for more information. Now, upon completion of the 95-hour course, you are eligible to take the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. The exam is included in the price. Once you pass, you are a Certified Breastfeeding Specialist. This is to recognize you for the level of education you have attained. With this certification, you can begin to collect your clinical hours towards the IBCLC exam. Now, if you're not sure where to start or you already have some lactation-specific education hours, then we have our core or bridge programs to meet your needs. They have the same advantages as the LCTP course. Our initial course is called core because it provides you with the core lactation education you need to understand what it means to begin supporting the normal course of breastfeeding. It's 52 plus hours of online education. It covers the basics such as anatomy and physiology, infant growth and development, supporting the preterm baby, medications and breastfeeding, and many more. At the end of the course is the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. 
Now the bridge course is ideal for people who have that basic lactation education and need an additional 45 hours to qualify for the IBLCE exam. Topics in our bridge course include legal and ethical concerns for the lactation consultant, infant feeding and disasters, breastfeeding the infant with medical challenges, case studies, and clinical skills videos. If you're not sure where to start, well, if you're new to the profession, I would say to take the core course. That way you can sort of get your feet wet and see if becoming an IBCLC fits. Now I know these requirements are, seem like a lot, and we're here to help you every step of the way. If you have questions about any of the pathways that don't get answered here, please be sure to reach out to our friendly customer support department. Many of our team are IBCLCs, and they know that process inside and out. Now we have three ways for you to earn your education depending on your goals and where you are right now in the process. If you have questions about what would be right for you, again, our customer support team is here to help. If you're not a healthcare professional working directly with parents and babies, getting those hours can feel like a challenge. We have two programs, one for Pathway 1 and one for Pathway 3 students. And when you're ready to sit for the exam, LER has you covered. We offer two versions of our very popular exam prep course. Both use the LER QBank system, which is a comprehensive system which includes practice exams, photo flashcards, anatomy flashcards, a study schedule, and a lot more. For those who take our 95-hour course, we include a discount to our exam prep course after you finish the 95-hour course. Now, our 90-hour course, as well as the core and bridge courses, are also available in Spanish. Capacitación en Lactancia is our website, which provides the same high-quality education found on LER in Spanish. At LER, we believe that access to high-quality lactation education should not be limited to those who live in countries with high incomes. We recognize that in many parts of the world, the relative purchasing power of a local currency may make the cost of lactation education inaccessible. As part of our commitment to increasing access to lactation training worldwide, our pricing is adjusted according to the student's country of residence. In alignment with our continued commitment to diversity, Lactation Education Resources is proud to announce our Rising Tide Lactation Equity Scholarship Program. It's designed to increase the number of Black and Latinx and Hispanic IBCLCs in the United States. We recognize that one of the greatest obstacles to entry into the field is access, specifically demonstrated by financial barriers. LER will remove that barrier for Rising Tide Scholarship awardees. We alternate these scholarships each year. In 2024, we are going to host our Rising Tide Scholarship for Black for those who identify as Black and who reside in the United States. You can find out more information on our website, lactationtraining.com forward slash rising tide. Our team is here to help you now and in the future. You can get your tech support any day of the week, seven days a week, we are here. You can get your questions answered by content experts in the field and we have ongoing support for each one of your steps. For example, a few weeks ago, someone reached out to one of our instructors with a question about their own practice. We made the connection to the instructor and the former student received the answer that they needed. Another student had a question about creating a policy. As Sakita mentioned, if it's not something that you are really good at or an expert at, it may be nice to become familiar with those things. And we did have an instructor who actually was an expert in that policy that the student was trying to develop. And so we connected the two of them and provided additional resources, which was great. Thank you very much for your time today. Okay, so are there any questions for us today, Sakita? It seems wow, like Angela, yeah, it seems like Wendy has been very busy. Um, there is, most of the questions have been answered. I do want to, there's a question, how do I find a mentor? I love when the when I get this question. Um, so there's various mentors. Like if you're saying a mentor that you can get clinical hours and skills, um, I believe absolutely, Wendy, put an answer in there. Just uh, click on that link. However, if you're thinking just a mentor to really bounce ideas off of or really to, to have someone to help you build your skills, and bounce situations off of. 
I think it's important that you network with other lactation professionals around you. It's like, you know, trying to get out of the silos of doing things separately. So if you have a local coalition, um, a breastfeeding coalition or, you know, support groups around, it's important to kind of start to build relationships with the people in your area who are who are doing this work. And so um, that's always one of the, 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 the information that I pass along to people is that, you know, yeah, building relationships is so important before really saying, hey, can you be my mentor? Uh, because with when you are a mentor, there's a lot of hours put being um, dedicated to growing someone as a clinician, someone that's competent, someone that has all the all of the skills that I talked about. And so, you know, you want you want the best mentor, you want the best relationship, right? <laughs> and the way you establish that is simply by building that relationship. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who, I agree with everything Sakita said, and for those of you who may live in countries where there are very few IBCLCs, then our hours program is an option. And it's actually the IBCLCs and La Leche League leaders and certified breastfeeding specialists at LER who can support you along the way. Of course, having someone who is in your backyard is something which is important. And even if you do utilize our Pathway One Hours program, we are going to encourage you to find those resources in your community that you can uh, collaborate with, such as other healthcare professionals and those who um, may be able to, you know, sort of support your journey. You know, you may become that expert in lactation care and providing light lactation care. And there may be others though, of course, who are those primary care providers that you can collaborate with and continue to work with and to support families sort of in a, in a multidisciplinary way, which is what IBCLCs do every single day as they work and collaborate with others, so. Yeah. There's another question. Wendy answered this question, but I think, um, you know, it helps to kind of put the framework into the different pathways. And it says, uh, does being a medical assistant count as a health care professional? Um, Wendy did put a link there. It's very important to understand that, you know, um, the, the basic things that makes, you know, a healthcare professional is having truly the core foundation of those courses. Those courses, so some medical assistant programs, I'm not sure this is a um, global type uh, audience. And so, you know, I cannot assume that all medical assistant programs are equal. Um, so in saying that, the, the point is, is that you have to have those background college courses. And if the medical assistant program does not provide that, then I would say that would be, you know, an absolute really like not necessarily counting as a healthcare professional. Also, there are some places that are like whether you are licensed or not. And so again, want to be real careful about like the language that we're using, but making sure that you have the core foundation courses that is necessary and the hours depending on which path. Mm -hmm. And really the list that IBLCE has, you know, that's why I was very careful to say this is who IBLCE says is a healthcare professional. And if you're not on that list, if you're in a different part of the world and not on that list, it doesn't mean that you are not. It's just that IBLC doesn't recognize that, you know, there's a small number of, of professions that they recognize. For example, uh, when I was in the UK, I came across people who are osteopaths. And we have osteopaths in the United States, but they are physicians in the United States and in the UK, they are not. So that's the thing, they're more, um, that's the thing is that osteopaths is not listed there. Are they healthcare professionals? I would say yes, but according to IBLCE, they're not on the list. So good. So finding a mentor, again, if you, a couple of folks don't have any experience, which, you know, do take a look at pathway one and pathway three. Those are the things that you'd like to do. Again, as Sakita and I, I think have both reiterated, finding someone who can be your mentor, who can answer those questions for you is something which is really key. So if you choose the, our pathway three program, or if you choose the pathway one program, specifically our hours program, then indeed you will receive some of that mentoring that you, that you need. Yeah, to that, Angela, I do want to say, 
If you don't have experience, do not be afraid to continue on the pathway. Um, you know, there's yes. something to be said about having tons of experience and not being open to changing evidence and not being open to new ways of doing and being. Um, and so with that being said, don't let that scare you if you don't have any, you know, if you have the passion and you have the wherewithal and perseverance to really want to be in this field, I would say, you know what? It doesn't matter that you don't have experience. Go get your experience. <laughs> right. I mean, I've had men mentees, I've had interns who uh, had a background in finance, uh, who've had backgrounds in, uh, you know, community, you know, sort of like community organizing, who've had backgrounds in just all sorts of different things. And I, you know, like in um, graphic design, they have background in graphic design and they really want to be a lactation consultant, you know, it fuels their passion. That's what they want to do. So that's great. Um, so by all means do, we need all the voices, right? If, if we have people who come from a variety of backgrounds, then it really does make the profession stronger and you can serve your community in a very unique way. What about the, the people who were lawyers before they were lactation consultants, right? So Kita, we know a handful of those as well. So, okay. and someone is mentioning their work as a WIC, so a women, infants and children peer counselor. Um, that experience definitely will help but both the education that you receive as a WIC peer counselor, as, as any peer counselor, as well as the communication skills that you have as well. Uh, someone is asking here, they're not a healthcare professional looking to become an IBCLC through pathway two or three, undergrad degree in general zoology, which covered most of the health ed courses but how do I obtain the courses I'm missing? I would highly recommend that you take a look at our um, partnership with Walden. The pricing on that is just really phenomenal and you can just take like one course or two courses and that's it. So you can either take all of the courses or you can just take individual courses and the price is really good. We've negotiated for a price which is better than what you could get at your local community college or just about any place else. So I would suggest that and if you are looking for a Pathway 2 program, we didn't really talk too much about it. And the reason why is because there's only like a handful of programs in the entire world. So actually going through a Pathway 2 program may be a bit of a challenge unless you have one of those universities in your backyard. Okay, great. Yeah, great stuff, great stuff, Angela. Um, this is, I love the questions. Always, always bring the questions and if, if there's any lingering questions, do reach out to us at support at lactationtraining.com and we will help and, and they will funnel and find the right person to answer your questions. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.